If you don't understand what's happening, you're never going to be able to, to get where you want to go. You're listening to the Kniep and It Real Jodcast. This is your host, Seth Kniep. What is up, everybody? Due to popular demand, Evan Kirkpatrick was invited back to the Jodcast. So I just want to say, Evan, thank you so much for being here today, man. And I'm so excited to have you back. We got into a very in-depth conversation last time. It flew by like that. And today we're going to talk about accounting, how to plan for your business, how to set up your business structure to save on taxes. We barely broke into this last time. We're going to go deeper on it this time. We're going to completely nerd out. I just want to say thank you to Evan Kirkpatrick for being here today. Hey, man. Glad to be back. Glad to have you. So I'm just going to fire away with questions. Is that cool with you? Absolutely. All right. There needs to be some kind of like joke, like what happens if you get two nerds talking about taxes? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I can't, I can't sit here and say like, you'd go watch this on network TV, but at least we're informative, right? I think we can make it so entertaining and so informative that they would watch this on network TV, but we will see. Okay. So here's my first question, Evan Kirkpatrick. By the way, guys, if you haven't yet, check out Evan Kirk Patrick. Evan, before we get in, just tell them where to go to find you. Kirkpatrick, PLLC.com. You can also email us at info at Kirkpatrick, PLLC.com. Uh, Facebook, Kirkpatrick, CPA, PLLC. LinkedIn, you can find me. Any of those work. Perfect. If you guys type in Evan Kirkpatrick, you're going to find them. Okay. So here's a question. Kirkpatrick, Evan Kirkpatrick, how does accounting help a growing business succeed? Because I know when I started in business, I thought, oh, accounting is the numbers guy. You just have to you know, make sure the numbers are taken care of. How does it actually help a business grow? Usually people think it's just, well, it's just to make sure all the books are good, so we're legal. But growth, accounting, like, do you ever even see those two words put together by regular business people? Help us understand, man. If you don't understand what's happening, you're never going to be able to, to get where you want to go. Never is probably too strong. I mean, people, I, I've seen brilliant people get by with messy financials, especially for a season. But what happens is, is that there'll be some point of resistance in there, in, in growth where, you know, a lot of times the number one thing you see happen is businesses that top line revenue keeps growing and growing and growing, and they're not actually making any more money. Right. And it usually goes back to, well, they don't, there's something broken in their financial model. And they don't understand it because there's something broken in their accounting system. Because at the end of the day, the point of accounting, you know, and this is this is going, you know, I have, I have a master's degree in accounting. And if you go into like nerd, um, essentially like, well, what is accounting world right. in, in academia? It's like the purpose of accounting is for management to, and ownership to be able to make decisions. Hmm. It's not like for tax, although hmm. a lot of people we see they're only doing record keeping for tax purposes. Right. But it's so that the owner and the the owner and the decision makers of the business can actually guide the business to where they want it to go. So instead of and it being so, reactive, oh we have numbers, we need to know where our money went, it's proactive. Yes, we need to know where our money went, where it's going, what we're spending, so we can make wise decisions for how much inventory to purchase, how to lower tax liability how to increase our profits, right? So you, what you're saying, it sounds like, is it's more strategical than most people are led to believe, right? You can't have strategy without, you can't have financial strategy without accounting. Hmm. And ultimately, at the end of the day, the point of a business is, well, I mean, you, you can have a business that something's not a quantitative goal, but the goal of business is to make money by and large, or at least that's one of the goals, right? Right. And money's a number. Yep. And so you have to understand how you're getting to that number or else, you know, you're kind of just throwing darts in the dark at that point. Yeah. So how would I use accounting to make strategical decisions to grow my business? Can you give me a tangible example of, you know, something people can put their hands on and understand? There are two big things that come to mind when you ask that. Mm -hmm. One is oftentimes there are products or entire product lines or services or entire service lines that don't actually make money for a business. Uh, 
It could be because of high customer acquisition costs. It can be just their low margin. And so the margin gets eaten up by overhead or cost of labor or something like that. But there can be projects that take a lot of ownership and decision maker and officer time and thought that don't actually drive any real financial results. Then what's the point? Right. Yeah. And usually what you see in a lot of businesses is that there's one thing that makes money and everything else is kind of a distraction. Hmm. And sometimes when you've got a business where like there's an understanding that they kind of need to pivot away from that one thing in the long term. Right. Okay. There, there's this feeling out phase where you kind of do just kind of flail around and lose money for a little bit until you figure out what your next one thing is. But in most businesses, there's one major service or product or something that's really driving the ship. And, so, you know, if you're running the, an e-commerce store, it can be a few different products together. But yeah, it, is that the Pareto principle then, where you're you're realizing 80% of your revenue is coming from 20% of your product, so the idea is get rid of all the extra fluff, the stuff that it's nice to have, but it really doesn't give you that great of ROI, and streamline focus on what's making the most. Almost like doing an audit on your business and accounting tells us, it shows us where that lies is that fair to yeah, say yeah yeah and there's a lot of you know there's sometimes where you kind of have to offer some synergistic things that don't really make you money in order to kind of like get people to your core product right like my my practice we don't offer bookkeeping um really hardly ever we will do one a year if it's just something that kind of like perfectly makes sense but there's times where like okay we kind of need to help people with some secondary things they're not really like they're, they don't drive my profit at the end of the day, right? Yeah. But it's part of what we offer. We don't want, we want a lower friction. We kind of, we want to make our clients happy. And so sometimes we do some stuff that doesn't make money. But if we offer, you know, if I was like, oh yeah, we're going to just go offer bookkeeping. And I just did it willy nilly and our price structure was completely off. And like, there's a way I could spend like a whole year building out a bookkeeping practice that doesn't actually make me money. Yeah, you probably and have so, to change your whole model because you're doing high end stuff people with wealth who need to know how to protect their assets and, and inc inc lower the tax liability and be smart about it, invest it. Whereas bookkeeping, I mean, and I don't mean this in offense to anyone who's a bookkeeper, but it is more of a dime a dozen. You don't need a major education to do bookkeeping. You don't need a super high salary to hire someone to do bookkeeping for your company, but regardless, it still has to be done. So that makes total sense to me. So going back to the business, so you mentioned getting rid of the fluff and the distractions, focusing on what matters. So, okay, so let's say you do accounting for a company. You know, you, you, do the, you handle their taxes, whatever that is. Right. How do you help them make that smart decision to increase their revenue to make smart business decisions help marry this principle of the numbers the the nerdy side to the strict well both really are very nerdy to the strategical side to help the business grow can you give me something yeah. really practical i mean because you know there are a bunch of ways like this is getting into the territory of the term cfo mm -hmm. and the term True. cfo gets thrown about a ton these days right, right particularly totally agree. like in people in the accounting industry that are offering a service right because uh, it sounds good kind of, cfo <laughs> chief financial exactly officer it. it makes it sound sophisticated <laughs> right. even though it's one of those things that sounds fancy but no one really knows what it means and i've talked about you know i'm in working in professional groups but like this is a growing part of things we do. And I still don't, I can't tell you what it means, right? Um, because it means whatever I can tell you what the acronym means. stands for. <laughs> right. Uh, but what it comes down to is there's a few different ways you could kind of, two different routes you could kind of take going down that road, right? One is very much about like, what I call like numerical analysis. It's things like forecasts and budgets. Like mm -hmm. it's very like number driven and, and comparing projections versus actual and, you know, okay, well, what do we need to do regarding spending a lot of time, stuff like that. And there could be a lot of value for that for some people. Yeah. Uh, if, if you kind of really need some guardrails in your business to like really kind of understand what's happening, like you've got something that's just out of control and you need to put, you need to put it in, a, in its place mm -hmm. that can definitely help. I'm kind of more of the mindset of usually what people really need. If you are a decision maker and owner in, in a relatively small business, what usually happens is that, you know, you're talking about nerdism, right? Most successful business owners are nerds about their business. They understand it intricately. They understand the details of their products, their customers, all that stuff. Yeah. And they struggle to step back and see the big picture sometimes. Yeah. And they struggle to kind of understand the numbers piece of it sometimes. So a lot of what 
a good, you know, you could call it a fractional CFO, you could call it business financial advisory, you could kind of call it whatever you want. But at the end of the day, what it is, is someone that understands both numbers and business that is kind of a little bit removed from it that could come in and essentially speak truth to the owner that's informed by the numerical reality. An example of this, I'm working with a retail business locally and they've had some struggles from COVID, right? And it's like, look, hey, like your payroll's too high here. Um, You're not going to be able to sustain the business if you keep spending this bunch of money on payroll. And we've looked at some cash flow forecasts and projections and, you know, roll things out six months. And kind of the overall framework of the numbers is really helpful to guide to, hey, like, it's not about, oh, we spent an extra $50 on office supplies this month. It's that there's this one number in here that you can control. And if you don't control it, it is going to swamp out everything else you're doing. So I like what you said, Evan, because it is hard sometimes for a business owner to make the tough decision of either firing someone or what sometimes is even harder, telling an employee staff member, hey, I have to give you a pay cut. COVID's hurt us a lot. We're going to have to reduce your pay. This is very uncomfortable. It's emotionally uncomfortable, especially for business leaders who lead by intuition and emotion and not facts and numbers. Now, I'm not making a false dichotomy here. I know people aren't as simple as that. People still use facts and numbers who are emotional and vice versa. But what I like about what you said is you're using the data. So maybe... If I, let's just take myself as an example. We're not in this place, but I'm going to pretend, okay? We're in a situation where, oh my goodness, our cash flow is hurting. We're about to go out of business. We're about to go bankrupt. Evan, help me. And you say, Seth, your payroll is way too high. Don't get nervous, staff. I promise this isn't about you. (laughs) (laughs) And and you say, Seth, your payroll is just, it's, it's not commensurate with the amount of money that's coming in. It just doesn't match up. So you're going to have to reduce your payroll by, you know, let's say, you know, 20,000 a month if you want to survive. So now yeah. you're using you're using heavy hitting numbers that is persuasive. Now I actually have facts. Now I can go to a staff member and I'm equipped and say, look, this isn't about you. You've been great. We've worked with you for a while, but we have to let you go. Or I'm going to ask you to take a pay cut for the next two or three months for the sake of the business to survive. Otherwise, the entire business will go down. Like it, I just like how what you're doing is you're bringing the analytics to bring the support so that the business owner can make the tough decision with courage. It's not just a gut feeling anymore. It's not just an intuition. The facts say it on the paper, a decision has to be made and payroll has to be cut. Yeah, well, you see a lot of time, payroll, I, I bring up payroll because for a growing business, particularly like in the service space, um, it, it, what I've seen several times is, okay, you know, things, things grow like, oh, things are, things are growing fast. We need to bring on all these people to do all these different things. Either if they're contractors or employees, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. And so it's just like, we need more people. We need more people. We need more people. And then you kind of build this monster. And then there's a down month in revenue for some reason. Like, you know, my primary Facebook ad isn't driving traffic like it did or, or <laughs> right. who knows what, right? And so that's the point where it's like, uh, we've actually accidentally built a model that's kind of out of whack. Hmm. Uh, and with products, you can get that too. A lot of times, you know, the classic example of these days is something like Uber, right? Which is a huge company. But, you know, fundamentally where it comes down to it is our average customer is worth X number of dollars and it takes more than that for us to acquire them. Right. So when we, when we set it up like that, you know, ultimately we've built a business where acquiring customers is bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it's kind of just those fundamental things. I could take an income statement or, you know, also known as a profit loss statement and just you know, right. throw a bunch of numbers at you, right? That's not what people need to succeed. That's not what really drives change. Right. It's, there's here are like some, a couple of big picture, really important things that need to get better in order to get you where you want to go. And yeah. the rest is, you know, it sounds crazy for an accountant to say, but there's a lot of detail in there that, you know, the IRS might care. And some of those details can be really important, like from a tax perspective. But in terms of the success of a business, you know, you're really looking at those big knobs. And if, you know, hey, it's like, you know, we like to buy nice office chairs or something like that. Usually that sort of thing, it's not really <laughs> A lot of those matter. things you can get rid of, those extra fluffy things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but I, the fluff, you know, at the end of the day, okay, if you've got, got $100,000 a year of fluff and you have $500,000 a year of revenue, yeah. okay, that's a problem, right? Yeah, because it's, it's all based got, on the comparison. 
Yeah, if you've got five thousand dollars a year of fluff and you've got five million dollars a year of revenue, it's I don't care deal. about that. Exactly, mm. it's the ratio. Yeah, that's a really good yeah. point. Because at what point I think it's so important for businesses to just, for businesses to decide they want to bring brand value. So they might have, you know, a fluffy chair or a really nice office or benefits like you can go to the gym, all that great stuff. That is great. That's excellent. And, and employees talk about that. And it does add brand value. But at the end of the day, how important is that compared to actual revenue? What people are being paid, the benefits that they get? Like at the end of the day, there's still some core elements that all that fluff can go and focus on what matters the most. Yeah, Guys, at the end of the day, it's going to be how much you charge for things. Yep. And how much, you know, how much you charge for things, if you're selling a physical product, how much you pay for that product, how much you pay people, right? and then maybe, and then rent and debt service and everything else tends to not, you know, if you're, if you're just an out of control, in an out of control situation, it can kind of add up. But, you know, most people these days, like, especially right now, like you got a home office and stuff like that. Overhead's not what's eating you alive a lot of the time. It, it's like, it's those big picture things that are just fundamental to what you're doing as a business. Yeah, well said. Guys, for those of you guys who have asked about what is done for you, I'm gonna take a moment to explain it. So we just opened it back up again. This is where you have an opportunity for us to build an Amazon store for you. You own the business 100%. Speaking of businesses, <laughs> it's perfect. You own the business 100%. You have control over the business. However, you pay us to build the business for you and then we share in the revenue from that business. If this is something you are interested in, if you want to invest in the 50 plus years of combined experience of me and my team, team selling on Amazon, building household brand names, then go to justonedime.com slash D as in done, F as in four, Y as in you. Okay. So Evan, back to you, my man. We talked about accounting for a moment. I'm going to switch a little bit and ask a simple question. What are some key metrics that every business owner should be looking at on a regular basis? So top line revenue is where people go by default and revenue is important, right? Uh, because if you've got a healthy business, revenue can fix most problems or fix a lot of problems at least. But you know, where you go from there, one is a concept called gross margin, which you know, when you're dealing with something like an Amazon store is very important, which gross margin is essentially revenue minus like direct cost of goods sold. So mm -hmm. I, I'm selling this thing for a dollar on Amazon and it costs me 40 cents or 70 cents or whatever. So like if I sell this thing on Amazon for a dollar that I paid 70 cents for, I have 30 cents of gross margin on that product. Right. And that's what the money I have to pay for everything else, right? To pay for overhead, to pay employees, to pay myself. Quick question before we move on. You mentioned gross margin. So if I sell something for a dollar, it costs me 70 cents to have the manufacturer produce it and ship it and I sell it for a dollar, then I'm making 30 cents gross margin. Got it. Here's my question. What is net margin? I mean, who knows, right? Like, <laughs> this is why I asked Evan, know. because a lot of people, this is how I do it. We include our overhead. We include our soft costs. We include our, you know, our ongoing operating costs to calculate net yeah. margin. But it seems like every CPA does it different. What net margin, like in my mind, net margin and net profit are synonymous terms, right? Net profit is essentially bottom line, like bottom yeah. line, bottom line. That's exactly um, what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. But I'm saying net know, margin versus gross. Yeah, because at the end of the day, like once you get below that, you know, overhead and things like that. Ultimately, it's a question of how structuring these things informs your business decisions, right? Because mm. I've seen, you know, one of the big accounting terms you see, particularly when you're dealing with uh, banks and stuff like that, it's a term called EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Mm -hmm. And without going into a long spiel about what each of those things is, you know, at the end of the day, it's essentially like you, you take what the money, you know, how much money does your business make? And then you add back essentially like the cost of financing and like long-term equipment and income taxes and right. things like that. So it's like, okay, operations wise, if I, if I essentially had infinite money to just put into this from the outside, you know, how much money does the business make? Right. And, and that's one way of looking at it. But in the real world, you know, 
you can get kind of lost in these different fancy metrics and banks kind of look at things one way because it suits them. Hmm. But at the end of the day, if you're a business owner, you're probably concerned first and foremost about how much money can I take out of this business and go put it in my pocket to save for retirement, pay for my mortgage, pay for whatever, right. you know, go on vacation, all that fun stuff. Or invest That's it really back what it comes in to. or invest it back in as a contribution to the business as well to grow it faster. So yeah, I, I don't want to take it off track too much. So you mentioned gross margin. So you talked about that. What are some other metrics that every business owner should be looking at on a regular basis? Big one is usually cost, customer acquisition cost. Now mm-hmm. that might look a little different in Amazon context, right? Because um, <laughs> the customer acquisition is, I, you know, I'm not an expert at that. Sure. I, you know, I'm better. I could talk about that a better day. expert at your <laughs> model. Right. 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 Which, you know, if it's something that's like ad driven and things like that, well, right. ad driven customer acquisition cost, it's like, okay, how much do I have to spend on ads? Yep. You know, one to get a call, so and then to get a call that actually turns into you know a sale of some variety. Okay, so I have to spend five hundred dollars on ads in order to get one sale. Okay, that's an important metric because so it's you wouldn't classically put it in something like gross margin, but fundamentally, when you're thinking about your business, it is because at the end of the day, like okay, this customer is going to likely have a lifetime value of X number of dollars. Well, okay, it cost me five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars to acquire this client. But then after that, well, that customer may pay more, come back to buy your product again, and therefore your your C your CPA, your cost per acquisition. <laughs> you like that? Well, I, goes well, your down, cost per acquisition right? doesn't change the value of your 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 lifetime customer value changes. Correct. Um, and so ultimately, what you want is you want that ratio of life or that essentially the raw dollar amount of lifetime client value less the cost to acquire that client. Ah, so what possible. you're saying is customer acquisition cost is kind of a moot point unless we also look at the lifetime value of a customer, right? Because yeah, you have to you put them to in, in context. It's not just an isolated number. We have to look at it. It's, it, it's like a, the ratio you talked about. If you're spending $5,000 on fluffy chairs, who cares if you're doing 5 million? But if you're spending right. $1,000 in fluffy chairs, you're only doing 20,000, well, now we have a problem because yeah. of the ratio. You're looking at it in context. It makes perfect yeah, sense. Yeah, and it's the same thing. That's a great point because you know here, like, okay, if my average lifetime client you know, if I make $20,000 a client and it costs me $1,000 to get them, then it's hard for me to lose, right? Yeah. Or if I'm Uber and it takes me $30 to acquire a client. And when you're looking at, when you're looking at lifetime client value here, you know, you can look at it from a gross margin perspective or right. from a gross revenue perspective. You're really getting it from a gross margin perspective, which is essentially what's the value of this client after like necessary cost to service them so how would you sell them something how would you go about determining and use any example you want from any industry but i'm curious evan how would you go about determining the lifetime value of a client and and let me qualify before you answer so selling an amazon some products it's just you know one shot and it's over other products other brands people come back if it's backpacking if it's particular toys for children if it's for uh, moms who are pregnant if it's a very niche product where the risk is a little higher or it's more of a nerdy like this is my passion this is what i love to do they come back to that brand to buy so in whatever industry you want to pull from doesn't have to be amazon how do you go about determining the lifetime value of a customer well, let me, let me use my own industry, right? Yeah. Um, because, okay, let's take like classic tax client or like the thing, the, the only thing we're doing for them fundamentally is annual tax prep. Okay. And, and, you know, in our case, it's not that we don't talk to them. Otherwise, it's just we essentially bake it into a single fee. Uh, but, okay, the only thing I'm doing, I'm sending one invoice a year. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, what what's the lifetime value? It's essentially, okay, what's my first year? times, you know, you could put some growth factor in there, kind of marginal at the end of the day, but you know, what's my, what's my average annual invoice going to be for this person times the number of years that I expect them to stick around. And that second number you have to determine. Let me real quick, let me just real quick repeat that just for everyone listening. So what is the average invoice cost for this customer times the number of years you think they will stay with you? Did I say it correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. what's up. Yeah, okay. So it's like okay. if I bill this person a thousand dollars a year, right. and they're going to be around for X number of years. Well, then the big question in many businesses, and you know, it works perfectly in like the AWS example you were talking about, mm-hmm. is um, is how many repeats you're going to have on that sale. Right. And that that's not something like if you've been in business for a year, that's not something your accounting records are going to be able to tell you um, necessarily. 
Right. Uh, particularly if you're like on some sort of annual recurring service, like what I'm talking about or something that like, you know, people buy seasonally. Um, and that's where you're going to have to bring in other things from outside of that, like industry norms and things like that is going to kind of be, you know, the average person stays with their accountant for X number of years. Yeah. Um, ah, so you're looking in at industry, five to seven. you're looking at industry, not just industry trends, but what are norms in industry? How long does someone tend to stay with the CPA? Okay, let's just say it's five years. Or let's say it's 10 years. Okay, it's 10 years. So if this person's invoice, just to keep it simple, let's say, you know, 50,000 a year and that's for 10 years. Boom, now we have 500,000. That's lifetime average value of yeah. a customer. And, and if uh, my client was worth $500,000, I could spend tons and tons of money to get them, right? Very um, good point. So now you know it's worth it when you're running Facebook ads, Instagram ads, YouTube ads, or even billboard ads or TV ads or radio ads, which are not dead yet. <laughs> Maybe they never will be. Now you know, okay, if I spend $2,000 just to get this one customer, it was more than worth it. What about this? Maybe you even spent you know, $10,000. And let's say that was your invoice for the first year, 10,000. So you don't make any money the first year, but you're doing it because by year two, three, and four, you know you'll make money. Do you go that far? If you told me right now, I have this client, mm -hmm. I can give you this prospect, right? You know, we're just gonna assume I'm gonna close on it, right? Yeah. And I will sell you this person that will pay you $10,000 a year for six years, and you gotta give me $15,000 right now. Mm -hmm. And assuming it doesn't cost me more than $45,000 to do it, what's the limiting factor in here? It's my ability to capitalize the business. Do I have $15,000? Interesting. So, yeah. That's where capital comes in. That's what people need to understand. You need capital to grow a business. If you don't have those 15,000, you're going to miss out on the 45,000. And here's what I love, Evan. You just demonstrated super practically how knowing your numbers, understanding your customer, lifetime value, understanding the industry norm, how long does this kind of customer stay in this kind of industry with a particular service provider as you are. You used all the data, so now you can go in with confidence and realize, man, if I just drop $5,000 in a Facebook ad and it got me a customer, that was not a loss, that was an absolute win because I have the knowledge needed to do it with confidence. But if I didn't know those numbers, maybe you feel like, man, I just broke the bank, I spent $5,000, what am I gonna do? Like, that, I think that's a perfect yeah. example of what you're saying here. Yeah, and so the, the question is, where does the model go wrong, right? One is we overestimate lifetime client value. This is again, like the Uber example. You think we tend like to that. do that more than underestimate, Evan? Do you, or do you think it's it industry depends. specific maybe? Uh, you know, a lot of times, if you're a service provider in particular, you tend to underestimate because a lot of services are just underpriced. So, Interesting. You know, I'm guilty of that. You know, some of my clients might not say that because some of them, you know, they understand our value and we charge for it. Yeah. Um, but you know, some of them like I hey, like I you know, I've owned this practice for four years. I acquired this practice. So I acquired some clients and I've gotten others. And early on in particular, I've been was very tentative about charging what I should be. You mm -hmm. know, what and the more I sit here and talk to you, it's the sort of exercise like this where it's like, okay, like, you know, you could have someone that's like, well, I'm going to talk to you for like one hour a month or something like that. Why should I charge you X? Why should I pay, you know, a thousand dollars a month to like where I'm going right. to get like one meeting a month or something like that. Well, right. that one hour a month could save your business, Yeah. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day. Yeah. And you have to get to the point where you actually charge what you're worth. Yeah. Now, do you think like some a, real quick, Evan, do you think some service providers undercharge and the reason I'm saying this is time is one of those precious assets you can't get a refund on. Once you spend time, you can't get it back. And I think in the world at large, I'll speak for America since I'm an American, people sometimes don't understand how precious time is. I had someone message me today and I, I really think this guy's good intention. I don't think he's some selfish jerk, but he did say, hey, could you mentor me for an hour every month? And so I wrote back and I said, well, were you looking for free mentorship? because I charge $1,000 an hour. And the reason I do that is because I got to a point where I was getting so many requests, I had no time left. I couldn't even take my wife on a date. So I raised the price until it now justified the time. Not because I think I'm all great and fancy. That's literally what my services are worth because we have trained people to be multimillionaires. But I think for some people, it, it's hard to, to see, well, you're just doing accounting or you're just doing training, but they're also giving time of their life they will never get back to you. So, I mean, don't you think this is like, perhaps speaks to a wider, deeper issue with mindset about the value of the asset of time? Something I didn't value even five years ago. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, I mean, 
for me, it kind of comes back to if you're really good at what you do, then you should, you, you can charge high prices. If you're not really good at what you do um, and you're a good salesperson, you can probably get away with it for a while. And they'll eventually um, catch up to you. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you see that time and time again. Oh, yeah. Just like the pretenders don't last. If you're really good at what you do, though, then people and you really can add insight or, uh, you know, fix problems for people, then ultimately it's going to be like what's happening with you, right? Where it's like, hey, like I've got more people than I can or want to service. Right. And so we're, you know, we're going to filter it down to the people that I can really truly deliver value on a very healthy price. And then it's more justified to raise the price. I think that's very fair. So so for someone entering the industry who's new and they want to help, they're going to charge lower prices, but as they get better, justifiably, they can charge more. And and here's what I would say to anyone who, and just so everyone knows, I'm not an affiliate of Evan. This isn't some big sale, but I'm simply doing this because he's adding value here. So I want you to know about what he does. But let me let me just share this. You will save, I know this by experience, Evan, you will save so much time and so much money going with a service that actually is good at it, that knows the ups and downs, that has failed and fallen on their face many times, that they've made all the mistakes for you, than trying to lowball it, getting someone who's cheaper, and ending up with potential more problems and a lot of more back and forth time. Do you think that's fair to say? Oh, absolutely. You know, in my own business, I don't make any pretense about the fact that, hey, like, we're not, I'm not in competition with Bob's Tax Shack down the street. Like, <laughs> I'm not, well, those I'm little not things in that competition. pop up, like, right around April every year, those little, you know what I'm talking about? The little houses that yeah. pop up and like, hey, well, your taxes. <laughs> yeah, the guy in the Statue of Liberty costume yes. like, down, yeah. down the road. Like, that's not <laughs> that's what a I'm different, trying to do here. Like, that's a different kind of model. That's like quick in, quick out, automated, simple, nothing complicated. You're like... Well, you expound. How are you different than the guy in the Statue of Liberty suit? <laughs> well, you know, this goes back into what we were talking about before when it comes to like, you know, it's ultimately like, what's your business model, right? You, there's, there's ways you can run accounting firms, right? One is I'm, gonna, I'm going to sell as many $300 tax returns as I can. I'm going to staff them super cheaply with whoever I can find that I can pay $17 an hour and we're just going to go on pure volume. Right. Right. Or, you know, the alternative, you know, let's take it to the too far opposite extreme, right? Is I'm going to charge $10,000 of tax return. I don't care what it looks like. You know, you're going to take it or you're not going to take it. And that's just the way it's going to be. Right. Yeah. And ultimately, you pay a premium for getting people that can actually talk and communicate and think through your problems and save this- you money. In our last podcast, you know how we titled it? Evan saved me 7,000 and something. Just based on that conversation we demonstrated in the example we used, that little piece of knowledge we discussed, remember Evan, would save someone $7,000. That's something else to think about. You get someone who knows what they're doing. Yeah, you pay them more, but they also save you more money. (laughs) Right. Yeah, and particularly on the tax side. And there's... There's times, you know, tax is kind of a funny animal, right? Because there's times where it's very much, we can save you more money. Right. There's times where part of what we're doing is we're saving you from trouble. Yeah. And that's tougher to quantify. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot true. of dilettantes. In what tax about the emotional right stress from trouble? What about the emotional stress and all those issues? It just brings up a really random question, Evan. Do you guys do audits for, or do you guys handle audits for people? Only our existing clients. Gotcha. That's smart because you already know their taxes and their situation. You can go in there with confidence. Yeah. The problem is, is that I discovered this early on of owning my own place. The, I had a couple people that the first reason they came here was they got an IRS notice. Mm-hmm. And it turned out those people typically were lying on their tax returns. Mm-hmm. And so I decided I'm just, you know, we're, we'll protect our own work. Um <laughs> You know, we'll protect our own, but we're not going and hunting for trouble with the Internal Revenue Service. Yep. There are people that specialize in that. I am not one of them. Yeah. Well, I'm so and glad you I, mentioned. I'm so glad you mentioned the Internal Revenue Service. And I'm going to ask a question that everyone hates to ask, but actually, this is a, such a great question. This is the last question for this episode. I want to ask everyone this. Well, specifically you, Evan. Evan, should I be scared of the IRS? To an extent, yes. Okay. Um, and here's why. The IRS does not, in my experience, they don't come hunting people just because. Um, There are audit programs that are essentially random. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, They're not very frequent, but they do essentially have the right to give you the tax return version of a colonoscopy. They do it on occasion because they, they use it to essentially calibrate their software. But in general, if you are being honest and you are not doing things that are known danger areas, you can get through an audit. Um, and it's okay if there are mistakes. They don't put people in jail for, for making innocent mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Th- that's not their thing. They'll make you. They'll make you fix it. They'll make yeah. you they'll charge you taxes. Yeah. Um, they might charge you penalties and interest for late payment or whatever. But they're not gonna, you know, take people out to the woodshed. Would you say they don't the take main, people out to the? Would, real quick, Evan. Would you say the main thing that they are looking for is if someone is intentionally deceiving and lying? That's where you're going to get nailed. Is that fair yes. to say? Versus someone they, who's ignorant. They will they take sh- you out to the woodshed. They'll take you to the they, woodshed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the other thing they're looking for is essentially abusive transactions. And that's things that there's a list of them. They're called tax shelters. That's what a tax shelter is, is essentially a transaction that is structured uh, in a way that, you know, there's various judicial doctrines that exist. But fundamentally, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Hmm. If it's the sort of thing where, like, if you give me ten thousand dollars, you're going to save fifteen thousand dollars on your taxes. Like, not like an advisor, but like, yeah, like a know, I'm going to sell thing. you this yeah. investment, and then yeah. you're going to get. And That's then, probably like, bogus. That's probably a scam. The IRS hunts that stuff. Yeah. Um, if you if your transaction only exists to avoid taxes, that's where you know. Because you can structure your affairs to save on taxes. Right. right. Like legally. Can, legally. Using yeah. the, the, the incentives written into the tax law as incentives to help the economy. Like real estate, for example. Yeah, you can um, do a cost seg, right? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. They right. want the, that stuff's in there for you to use. Right. But if I go and, you know, there are ways, for instance, like a big one is it's known it's known as a syndicated conservation easement, which is a say, say that one more time slower. Syndicated conservation easement. Syn- syndicated conservation easement or easement? Easement. Easement. Which Got essentially it. Okay. in synopsizing everything down into like two sentences, right? It's essentially a thing where people invest money with a, a real estate person to buy a piece of property. And then a portion of that property is given to some preservation organization or something like that. Mm-hmm. And charitable contribution deductions are taken at fair market value. Mm-hmm. It's detached from your costs. Ah. So it's like, okay, I can put a hundred thousand dollars in this deal. And then this deal is going to create this like half million dollar charitable contribution deduction. That's worth more than a hundred thousand dollars. Interesting. Something like that. Yeah. That's cheating. That's getting into the church, <laughs> like stuff like right. that, where it's like, okay, that's what, that was the example I had in my head, where it's like, you put some money in and then you get a tax write off. That's more than that. Right. Uh, that stuff gets hunted down eventually. Yeah. And they may not put you in jail for something like that. But they're going to find you and they're going to make your life hell for a while because of all the back and forth and the forms. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to say something. I've spoken to the IRS multiple times. I wasn't audited. That's not why. But when I was first learning how to start a business, I had questions. I'd call them. What about my EIN? Every single person I talked to was really nice. And I just thought, you know what? They're real people. They're real people. You know, they have to eat. They have to drink. They have to sleep. They have ups and downs. They're doing their job. Like, I, I really don't see, I, I, has the IRS done stuff that I think is stupid? Have they unfairly targeted certain organizations? Yes, I agree. But it doesn't make the entire system evil just because their job is to be a tax collector. Any more than a lawyer's job is to indict or defend, you know, any more than a firefighter's job is to help. Like, just, I think remembering why they're there can help. And, you know, I, I spoke to uh, one of the people we've worked with for a while who's into financial investing and, and, and they made this point. They said, look, if, you, if you're just respectful and you show kindness and, and patience, like they'll work with you. Like they're, they're not all jerks there. I'm sure maybe there, some individuals are. There's really are, but, not many. Like yeah. you said, they're trying to get through the day. Yeah. Ultimately, if you're an honest person, the IRS is on your side. Yeah. And they just need proof. They, they have just want questions. to know the truth. Yeah. Yeah. If they have questions and you can be organized, you know, generally I wouldn't, you know, generally like you want to be organized, right? You're the person you are dealing with has a stack load of cases that they got to get through and they're just trying to make sure, you know, that things are being done correctly. If you can bring them the information they need and be honest or forthright, you know, and truthfully, like if you have things that you find that are major issues that you know, they're going to find out, save yourself some trouble generally, in my opinion, and, and, and be honest with the IRS. Just tell them, because, tell them up front because then at least everything's out in the open and you can say, look, I messed up. I'm sorry. Here's where we're at. That'll build trust faster. Because at the end of the day, you're still working with individuals making decisions like any other human. And those humans yeah. do have the power 
to get you in trouble or not based on the facts. So they're still yeah. humans. And was someone going to respect you more if you own up or if you try to hide it until they find out? I, I think that's really, yeah. that, really You have an evidence. agent and you have that agent's manager and you need to get those people to approve on whatever. And it's just, you know, some you you can get one that rolls up on the wrong side of the bed on your initial meeting and... <laughs> You know, there's there's an agent lottery in there, but by and large, they're just trying to do their jobs too. Right. I'm not going to say they're not they're not they're not overly technically skilled. Mm. Generally, mm. Um, that's not so they how like you things, wind up at the IRS. They like they're not a bunch of CPAs being mm. mailed. They like physical paper versus e sign. Hello. Well, sign, their <laughs> their IT infrastructure is not awesome but, um, <laughs> if you've ever nice gotten an IRS it. transcript you can see like this looks like it came out of some software program from the 90s and it <laughs> probably did uh, um, oh man but you know at the end of the day just be forthright yeah. and things will be okay yeah Evan if I was to or anyone here was to say Evan how can you help me what do you do can you take 15 seconds to summarize what do you do to help business owners? I want everyone who's listening or watching on video, you guys need to know this guy. If, if Just listen to what he says. Go for it, Evan. And tell us where to find you one yeah. more time. One tax. Yeah, I mean, duh, right? Two, did you hear that whole spiel about essentially like finding like the key, using financial information to find the key things that you need to make your business better? If that sounds like that's helpful to you, then we can talk. Absolutely. And where do they go to find you, Evan? KirkpatrickPLLC.com. Uh, info at kirkpatrickplc.com if you want to email directly. You can call the office at 512-246-9669. Find Kirkpatrick CPA or myself, Evan Kirkpatrick, on LinkedIn or on Facebook. Awesome. All right. Well, Evan, thank you again for being here. Guys, I hope that you're watching. You got a ton of value out of this today. Do not forget to look up Evan Kirkpatrick. He is right here in Austin, Texas, but he's not limited to Austin, Texas. Thanks again, Evan. Have an awesome day, man. Pleasure. Pleasure.